stand here so the live stream can continue. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Food Stand Spotlight. Uh, just a quick show of hands. How many of you have been here before? Wow. All right. So we have a little audience. Um, and before we get started into the programming, I just want to go around and see who's actually in the audience. If you run a food business, please raise your hand. All right. If you want to run a food business, please raise your hand. <laughs> Keep on tracking. Um, if you are in food media or if you're a food writer, okay. Any investors in the house? Raise your hand proudly. Um, any farmers or growers of any kind? Cool. Buyers of food, if you are work for a supplier. Yeah, pretty sure. Um, cool. Uh, so um, thank you, everybody, for coming to the September edition of Food Stand Spotlight. Uh, we took August off because everybody takes August off, um, and we're excited to see all of you back in the room. Um, we have a really, really awesome program for you guys tonight. Uh, just a quick run of show so you understand what's happening. I'm going to do a quick welcome, explain what Food Stand is, and one of these lovely folks from Slow Money is going to explain what Slow Money is so you know why we're all here today. Um, we have a couple of community announcements an alumni speaker, so a food stand presenter who's basically been super successful and wants to share her story. And then we're going to kick it off with the present uh, with the presenters. You've met most of them in the back with their products, so um, definitely uh, get your phones ready to go because we're going to be doing some texting to uh, live poll as they're presenting. Um, so really quickly, just so everybody knows who food stand is, my name is Rachna. I'm uh, the CEO and co-founder of Food Stand. You guys met Udi in the front. He's our CTO. Everybody say hi, Udi. Hi, Udi. Uh, we also have a new member of our team, Summer Ray Oaks, who's our head of marketing. Hopefully, you guys got a cocktail from Summer. Uh, and then Annie, who is part of our content team, is here as well. So um, this is the team. If you guys have questions about Food Stand, come find us. Um, so what is Food Stand? Uh, well, before we get there, we want to ask the question, You know, what if good food were the only option? What if it were the default? That's really the world we're trying to create. And what if, instead of the grocery store looking like this, the sort of mess of things that come in packages and boxes that you know, just kind of sit on a shelf and we don't really know where they came from or what's in them, all of the stores look like this. That's really the world that Food Stand is trying to create. Um, and the problem that we think about solving every single day is the fact that good food is not the easier choice today. No matter how we slice and dice the pie, it's quite complicated, even as complicated or more complicated than doing your taxes. Now, I tried to do my taxes last year. It was horrible, so I can address the fact that it is a definitely, definitely painful process. So eating is definitely a choice and, a, and, a, and something we think about a lot, that making good food choices is not as easy as it should be. And that's really the, what we're here to solve. And so our mission at Food Stand is to democratize good eating. That means making it accessible and easy to understand for all people everywhere, as opposed to just the handful of people that have time or money or the right folks around them building the right food community. And so Food Stand's first products that we're launching into market, I think many of you guys are on the Food Stand app. Um, if you guys have the Food Stand app, please raise your hand. Yay, Food Standers. Uh, so Food Stand, um, the, the community that we're trying to connect is really existing here in this space, but most importantly on a digital platform so we can reach far and wide beyond just the New York City region. And um, so we, we're really focused on building a community that teaches other people, that shares amazing food finds and, and lessons from other people, uh, and then reinforces this idea that good food can be easier and here's how we do it. Um, so we'd love for you guys to join. If you don't have the app, uh, definitely download it. We are in private beta, but you guys as spotlight attendees can get in. So sign up with the food spotlight. Um, just to, in the interest of time, here's your spotlight code. Definitely uh, download it if you have an iPhone and take a look. Uh, so that's spotlight and food stand. Uh, and I'm going to turn it over to who's, who drew straws and, and got the slow money. The slow money bit. Cool. Uh, so this is Christine. She's going to do a quick introduction of Slow Money, which is our co-host organization. We don't have a slide, we so, slide. so we're gonna we're just gonna hang here. This is also okay. Nice work on. So while you have your <laughs> iPhones out, you can look up slowmoneynyc.org um, and find um, a little bit about us. Slow Money in New York City is part of a national movement that is um, focused on creating a new economy based on knowing where our food com comes from. Um, and where our money goes. And so we try to connect uh, food entrepreneurs, uh, local and sustainable growers, with investors who want to support the sustainable food economy. Um, it's pretty simple in its idea. Um, and what that means is um, we like to 
in convening gatherings like this, where entrepreneurs, investors, and other people interested in good, healthy local food um, can meet each other and talk about how to support each other. We've helped to build a network of investors, um, the Food Shed Investors of New York, um, who are all concerned about that also. Um, and we um, have a flagship event called Food and Enterprise that we host in the spring. It's entering its fifth or sixth year. Um, and the actual dates will be announced soon, but it will definitely be in April, and it will most likely be in Brooklyn again, um, and we, where we bring together lots of different kinds of food entrepreneurs with investors and people who want to build a healthy food economy. And that's Slow Food and uh, Slow Money NYC. Oh, thanks, Steve. <laughs> So really quickly before we start the actual presentations, I just want to open it up to any community announcements. I know we definitely have one from Peter, who is the gracious gifter of the cheese you had today before it was gone. So Peter, come on up. Yay, Peter. Hey, um, I'm from Consider Bardwell Farm, which is a 300-acre dairy farm in Vermont. Um, we raise cows and goats on rotationally grazed, pristine pasture. It's all protected grasslands, which is great, but it also means we can't grow or can't build anything there, which is kind of limiting expansion. Um, yeah, we sell in the farmer's markets. We distribute nationally. It's all entirely raw milk. Um, it's a confusing name to remember, but it was a guy who started the farm in 1863, and there was a whole family line of considers pre preceding him, but very confusing to most customers, but we get through it one way or another. Anyway, thanks for having the cheese. Thanks for destroying the cheese. <laughs> Destroy more of it anytime you want. Thank you. All right. Um, any other quick community announcements? Anybody hosting an event, hiring? Yes, Marty. Marty's being tested. We're going to be in Bryant Park for November and December. We're looking for uh, chefs, cooks, burger flippers, and casters. Uh, it's um, New Regrowth at gmail.com. Marty's being the best way to do it. Nobody, nobody, nobody. Cool. Thanks, Brian. Anybody else? Yes? Um, the Mommy Food Company, we make delicious dip and crackers. We're doing a series of taste events in October, different viewers. We'll be back here. So, our first event is October 9 in Soho West, New York, in the afternoon. Check us out at Yamami Food. Fantastic. Both of you send me that info so I can send it in the email afterwards. Cool. Yep. I'm cheating, but I forgot to mention that we are finalists for the Martha Stewart American Page. Yay! Woo! Do we have to vote? How do we help you? Do we tweet you? How do we help you? Yes. Okay. Awesome. Awesome. So we will make sure everybody has that link too. Cool. All right. So next up, we have Amanda Fuller. Uh, yes, Amanda, we called her name. Um, so Amanda Fuller uh, runs a company called Rooted and Why. Um, for those of you who are loyal Food Stance Valley attendees, you'll remember her from a few months ago. She's here to tell us a bit about what she's been up to since she presented here. So Amanda, take it away. Thanks. Hi, everyone. I completely forgot that I was doing this, but I'm glad to be up here talking to you guys. Um, we have had a really great season. We've put together um, eight tours this season. We've had over 150 people out, and it's always been Really, really incredible experience um, watching people connect with their food. Um, we run tours of, to local farms and food producers. We've gone to everything from dairy farms to oyster farms to breweries, um, Fishkill Farms, where we got to do some amazing cherry picking this summer. We have uh, a cheese-themed tour coming up this weekend, which is going to be September 26th. We're going up to Sprout Creek Farm to play with the cows and goats there. <laughs> See their amazing practices that they have. And then we're coming down and doing a cheese making workshop with another fellow food entrepreneur, Cheese Grotto. So um, that's going to be a great event. Um, please follow us on social media on oh, it's Rooted NY for Instagram, Facebook, and all that. Um, and this has been such a great, great experience. I think I encourage anyone that wants to come up here and share your story, share your business, if you're you know, testing things out, whatever stage you're at, it's, it's an incredible, incredible community to be part of. So thank you, Rasha. Thanks, Amanda. <laughs> All right. Uh, so we're going to get started now with the presentations. Um, but first, we're going to meet our panelists because they're here to give us some uh, really awesome, smart advice that is real talk and not just a lot of fluff. So first, Christopher Washington. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm Christopher Washington. I am the CEO of Radical Form Company. <clears throat> Radical Form Company uh, seeks to kind of transform the way that you purchase produce. 
Um, we are developing the technology that uh, can grow food, um, you know, in a very finite space, um, but get the same cost efficiencies as traditional agriculture um, in an organic fashion. Um, and we sell our produce around uh, locally uh, to local foods and things like that. So I'm here to kind of represent um, the idea of, uh, you know, running a tech company, um, running a farming company, uh, or farmers in general. Um, and so I look forward to having that. Dora, you're next. Hi, I'm Dora Goldstein. Uh, I'm a partner at Capitalism Rosamond, which is a, a large law firm uh, where I had our startup practice in New York. Uh, I'm also here wearing a, a slightly different hat uh, involved with Small Money at NYC, uh, but also with uh, Bootjet Investors in New York. Uh, so I'm a social impact investor uh, in food businesses uh, in New York, Bootjet. Hi, I'm Christine Vico. I'm a consultant. My company is called CFO on Speed Dial, and I provide uh, financial management and strategy services to the growth stage companies, um, many of whom are food companies, but also a broad range of social impact companies. Um, so I'm interested. Um, I love talking about um, or business structure, management, um, and getting money to grow profits in the United States. Cool. All right. Well, thank you guys. Good round of applause. So we're going to start with our first presenter, a year in the place. Take it away. And here's your cooker, and your time is here. Okay. Just so you guys know, there's a timer, so if you see, you can go over just wait. <laughs> we have a tight schedule. All right. Go ahead. Hi, everyone. I'm Vicente, and I'm the founder of Mise en Place. Uh, we believe in bringing people back around the dinner table. Unfortunately, the communal spirit of dinner is being lost to low-quality, convenient food options. So think about when you're ordering Seamless, ordering Thai food or pizza. You know, you're throwing on the next episode of Game of Thrones or House of Cards or whatever your latest Netflix binge is. But we found that when we cooked, we actually wanted to share that with friends and family around a table, not around a TV. So at Mise en Place, I, we want to bring people back around the dinner table by redefining people's definition of cooking. So let me introduce you to Sally. Sally is an urban millennial. She's tired of ordering from Seamless, but she wants to eat healthier. She likes to cook, but she doesn't have the time. Sally loves Mise en Place because by providing her fully prepped ingredients, we allow her to cook a healthy meal at home on her schedule. Now, to a lot of us, cooking is like a really fun process. We like going to the farmer's market, picking the produce, and prepping it. But to most people, that's an art torturous process. So cooking certainly takes time, yet 77% of people like to cook, and 80% would cook more if they had more time. So you know, when we think about cooking, we think about putting ingredients in a pan and mixing it, not going to the grocery store and peeling onions. So our, you know, when you look at this, at this uh, process, it's no wonder why Sally doesn't cook more frequently. So our goal was to create a solution to save people time, to allow people to cook despite a demanding career and a constantly changing schedule. Now, we know of our competitors. One may have just been recently valued at $2.7 billion, uh, but, <laughs> but uh, what, uh, they've done a great job educating the market. But what they haven't done is address what we call the last mile of cooking, the prep. So we peel, chop, and dice, allowing our customers to focus on the cook part of cooking. So our ingredients come in an insulated tote. We provide a fun cooking experience, and you're left with a home healthy cooked meal at a fraction of the time. So Sally also leads a very busy life. Her schedule is constantly changing. That's why she loves on-demand services, and that's why we deliver same day. So that obviously means logistics. Uh, we've interviewed close to 20 couriers in New York City, and we've established partnerships with two high-quality partners, Uber and Zipmans. Now, we're all aware that the US food industry is a huge market, $600 billion. But what's more important is that only 3% of that is being done online. So food and grocery are, are still one of the largest industries, so overwhelmingly offline and its migration to online will create a huge market opportunity. This is also an extremely scalable business. As volume grows, margins improve on both ends of our spectrum. So just like to take a standard order, it'll be, that yields us around 5%. But just increasing that to a four-plate order gets us to around 23% margins because of delivery synergies. As most of you are already aware, delivery logistics in the food industry is like one of the highest costs. And so by spreading that amongst multiple orders, you get much higher synergies. Uh, as I mentioned, our, our customer, our competitors have certainly educated the market, but we're the next natural step in providing a complete uh, solution to those seeking healthier home-cooked meals. We've spoken to customers of these services, and after trying our meals, they love how much time we save them. 
Um, my background on myself, I spent the last five years at J.P. Morgan. I came from a Filipino household where cooking dinners were an every night occurrence. So it was a hard shift for me from doing that to then ordering seamless five nights a week. Um, but I knew there had to be a better option. Since starting earlier this year, we've been accepted to the Hot Bread Kitchen Incubator, giving us commercial kitchen access in, in Manhattan. We have successfully raised our Kickstarter earlier this year, uh, and we're looking to build out our team, hopefully with a private beta launch uh, later this November. Uh, help us bring people back around the dinner table. Thanks. We're going to text the word food stand to 22333 to participate in the live polling as these guys have a lovely time. Um, thanks. All right. Um, go ahead. Um, so, first, great, you want to start? Oh, uh, yeah, first, great job. Um, I really like that slide in which you talked about your market fit. And the way that you visualized it, um, you know, by by moving everything else up and then making your solution very convenient, um, I thought that was really good. Um, really kind of got me involved, um, so I could see the fit. Uh, you spoke out about logistics and talking about some of the competitors that you have in the field. There's a lot of bigger. There's a lot of bigger companies that have exited. Um, you know, and they were extremely well capitalized. Um, what do you think about your one delivery fee? Um, do you have one, uh, or are you absorbing that in the cost? Of the yeah, that's a great question. We're, so we are absorbing the cost of that. Uh, our, I briefly mentioned it, but it's we're charging around fifteen dollars per plate. Uh, and if you compare that to the other meal kit companies, they charge anywhere between nine to twelve. So it's certainly a premium, but with the same day delivery and the added uh, prep. Um, that's certainly, I think, we justify the $15 pricing. Uh, but yeah, logistics is certainly, uh, the delivery fee is the biggest, one of the largest components of our cost. And that's why after talking to 20 couriers, you, you realize that the courier industry in New York is very antiquated. Uh, and so we've chosen two partners who, A, have forward-thinking views and given us volunteer pricing that with a thought that, you know, as your volume increases, that becomes more economical. And that's what I meant by, uh, as, a, as a business model, where margins improve with volume. And with our partnership with Uber, real quick, was we actually reached out to them for Uber Eats. Uh, but then they pointed us to, hey, look, we think your business model is much more suited for what they call Uber Rush. And we've been luckily invited to their early beta program because they're trying to build that on a more enterprise scale. Right, so a couple of quick questions. Um, the, the problem I think that you're trying to address is basically chopping ingredients at the end. It's, it's that last bit of prep, right? Have you sort of done any determination of what that actually, whether there's an actual need there? Because yeah. Obviously, or and what we, what did you see in terms of that? Yeah. Uh, that need? So, so the biggest thing when we talk to current customers at Plated, they're not really opposed to prepping. Everything leads down to they just don't have time. So I don't think people inherently don't like going grocery shopping or don't like prepping the food. It's just they don't have the time for it. So when you so we talk to current customers at Plated, Blade for HelloFresh. And the biggest disadvantage is that they still find themselves spending an hour, hour and a half in the kitchen. And so at that point, they don't feel like they save any time. So when they tr we try their service and then they try ours, they actually enjoy that because A, they're trying much more diverse and exotic recipes that would have never been in their wheelhouse on a weekday. Um, and they love the service because it's the same day delivery and the prep, the, uh, saving them 30, 45 minutes. And, and you had mentioned um, exotic recipes. Yeah. Right? How are you sourcing the recipes and the ingredients that you're going to use? So yeah. What's the, the theme behind that? Right. So from a recipe standpoint, we're a local New York City company. We want to showcase local New York City chefs, bloggers, uh, nutritionists, registered dietitians. So we've actually accepted a position called recipe contributors. We're bootstrapping our company, so we have no position to pay. But a lot of these people, bloggers especially, love to showcase their thing for exposure. So for example, we've got one blogger who goes to the farmer's market every day, and she's got recipes, but her followers like, I'll never make that, because I don't go to the farmer's market that frequently. And so she's showcasing her products on our site. So by focusing on New York City, local bloggers, we get seasonal products. From an ingredient perspective, we're so, all the food that we're displaying today was all sourced from the Union Square Farmer's Market. We've already established a relationship with Green Market Co. As we, problem is, obviously, that's a wholesale industry. And so once we create the volume to do that, um, we'll, we'll work with them. We've also spoken directly with some farmers. 
uh, some are obviously more forward thinking than others, and some want to know how many pallets. I'm like, uh, I only need like a couple onions. Um, but uh, but a lot of them are having that discussion, and they're open to it. Um, and so. Um, sorry, just to follow up real quick on that question about prepping. Um, when what's to stop new apron from prepping food and doing? Yeah, that's a question we get frequently. Uh, if you know their business model, they deliver from a lot of regional hubs. So uh, I think they deliver from 13 regional hubs, and whatever. And the way that works is you have to order about a week in advance. Uh, so whatever you're receiving, first of all, like two to three days at least in transit. Um, from a prep perspective, that food will go bad quickly. Uh, and secondly, they can't do the same day delivery, most importantly because of the logistics system they set up and the subscription model that they set up. So unless they want to sort of so all of a sudden have a hyper-local footprint, they really can't either prep or do the same day delivery. Um, think about avocados, right? Your worst enemy. By the time you're serving the guac, it's already browning. Uh, but for us, we are using either reduced oxygen packaging or um, resealable bags, that, and we've tested a lot of these. Some work, some don't. We actually suck in vacuum packaging, uh, but others do great. So. so you're preparing to launch. So you're tell me about how you're doing these testing and how right. wide an audience you've tested on so far, and right. what makes you think you can really get to scale to compete with something like that. Yeah. Uh, so. We've done around 30 to 40 trials of, of people who have tried the service and have, have not. And what's first of all what's surprising is that the meal kit industry, as, as, as in the reason we know it as taking off, I think it's still a large 40% of the market don't even know what plated women are. So from an education standpoint, you know, that's helpful. Um, we've launched our Kickstarter. Uh, we, we successfully raised our Kickstarter earlier this year, so from the scale play, it's really the only thing that we're, we're lacking is um, is our sort of backlog of recipes that we're creating, and that's what's really just pushing out our launch team. As soon as we open up the doors, people are going to want a rotating menu week over week, and so we need to do that. Uh, and, then, and, and even after a recipe is done, we have to food style it, we have to prep it, and we have to make a recipe that home cooks can understand and give them the tips, like what is slicing against the grain? Like here's a picture. Um, and so I think in terms of scaling up to plate and blueprint, I'm not really sure that even scaling from a national level is like the right play. They're, not even, they're a good eggs, right? We all know they're shutting down all operations and bringing it back into San Francisco. So in my mind, my, my goal is not really to nationalize right away. Let's, let's, New York is a great market, and let's get that right. Okay. All right, is that it? That's the Tyler, so unfortunately, we're here. <laughs> okay, perfect. Right. Thank you, everyone. I'm going to bring this closer to you guys so you can see. Where am I putting the clicker? You're going to point it this way. Good evening, everyone. I'm Saskia, and I'm the founder of Happy Belly Baby. I only have four minutes, so I'm going to jump right in. I'm not going to go through this table of contents. but. What we're going to talk to you about today is a new category of real food for babies that we're creating. And so before we actually get into it, let's talk about the baby food market. The baby food market is a $2 billion industry, and it's been driven primarily by the growth in organic baby food. So if you look at this chart right here, non-organic baby food in a decline. Organic baby food expected to grow at a 2%, 22% CAGR over the next two years. And so this is all amazing, right? Because we're committing to giving our children cleaner food, better food. But even with this move towards organic and all of these companies standing behind it, we're still seeing this. So one in every three kids today is obese. Childhood obesity is on the rise. And this is kids ages 2 to 19. And all of this has to do with feeding habits, right? Not when they're old, but the habits that we're forming from the moment they start eating. The other thing that we're seeing, picky eaters. This, these two words are the words that parents fear the most. I am telling you. When you Google search this, 1.68 million results. Compare that to 1.5 million for diaper rash. This is how much people care about it. Right? I mean, it's a, it's a big deal. And we want to figure out how to solve it. Because we know that this is directly correlated to how kids are eating and the unhealthy habits that we're seeing in these children who gravitate towards macaroni and cheese. And so this is where the baby food revolution comes in. Everyone's talking about it. The media is talking about it. Experts are talking about it. And there's new research in the field that tells us that everything that we've been told over the last decade is wrong. There's no research to substantiate it. 
So all this bland food and, and flavorless mush that we're supposed to introduce babies to when they first start eating, no more. That's out the window. And in fact, the research is showing that all of this has been contributing to the generation of picky eaters that we're seeing today, who, by the way, are then eating sodium-rich foods like macaroni and cheese and turning away from the vegetables. And so this is where we come in. So what's our mission? Our mission, this is just, I, I, hope, I hope everybody had a chance to sample it, but this is some of our food, right? We're flavoring our food. We're actually giving babies real food with rosemary and thyme and basil and mint. We're teaching them how to experience flavors from the moment they start eating. We also never mix our fruits and vegetables, but we'll get into that in a second. By the way, one thing that I forgot to mention, what we're now discovering is the way to feed children, so introducing flavors from the onset, is what cultures around the world have been doing for centuries. So spices, herbs, vegetables, not mixing fruits and, ve and, and vegetables, this is what, how other cultures have been feeding their children, and they don't have the high incidence of childhood obesity that we have in this country. So what's our mission? Our mission is to create a new generation of helpful, adventurous eaters, starting with a baby's very first bite. Why is this relevant today? It's relevant because, one, traceability and sustainability are becoming an increasingly important part of everyday life. As the standard for food production has become industrialized, people are more interested in understanding where their food comes from, reading ingredient labels, and really connecting to the food that they're eating. And that translates into how babies are eating too, because childhood obesity is, obesity is on the rise. We're combating a problem when it's already too late. Our values, these are our three values, and we'll get into each of these in a second. But essentially, it's mostly local ingredients. We source from the farms in the region that have produce in season, so it tastes very different than if you're buying something when it's out of season or from California and it's being shipped across the country. We use real flavor. Again, we don't mask our vegetables under fruit. We season with herbs and spices. And everything we make is made with five ingredients or less. Why? Because you really don't need a lot more than that to make food taste good and be good for you. Real flavor. Flavor innovation. You cannot walk in the baby food aisle today and see cauliflower and bell peppers as a flavor for baby food. You will not find broccoli and Swiss chard. Is that me? <laughs> Minimally processed, we talked about this already. Traceability, mostly local. Farm networks is the way we source. I'm sure this is a question that some of, some of you are thinking. We actually deal with the farms directly and we work with food hubs to get the produce into our kitchen and produce it. And then consumers love us already. This is the timeline of what it looks like. We launched in, Mar we launched in March. We got into farmers markets in April. Mrs. Green stores in June and August. Farm to People in September, launched our Kickstarter campaign this month too, and we're starting at New Farmers Markets later in the month. So this is our big question. This is where we are today, right? We've accomplished a lot in the last four and a half months, but how do you take this artisanal product that's made, that's handcrafted from real food and not processed food, and make it the national norm? All right. Uh, is there a question? Uh, well, I would say you've got a great case in terms of what where your starting point is. Um, obviously, you got kind of rushed in the end, and that was where I would probably spend some time digging out more of kind of what where you're at, where you think you're going. It's a very uh, compelling question, and I've been thinking about this with the food companies I work with about how we take our our well handcrafted and. Uh, I think that's a, a compelling problem for many people in this. So, do you have any answer? I was hoping you would. You know, all um, answers tend to point towards co packers or co manufacturers. And the co manufacturers that we've explored have not been able to deliver what we deliver, which is not taking a puree and pureeing it again and seasoning it with powdered basil and putting it in a jar. You know, we, we actually want to be. Very, not so far removed from the whole vegetable and the whole fruit. Right. And so that's tough to do. I'm sure there's a co packer out there that's willing to work with us in, in the type of in delivering the type of product we want, but that's not an easy one. So that's one of your first hurdles. So, a couple of quick questions that I, I you may have been getting to. In terms of how, and it, it's sort of maybe in this question, it's, is it shelf stable? I think you have no preservatives. I, I didn't mention that, so yeah. It's no. Frozen? Frozen. Okay. Um, I don't, I, and this is not a market I know terribly well. Are there other frozen baby food products out there? Yeah. Oh, no. I can ask why, why 
We don't have preservatives in it. So the only other way to, to make it shelf stable without using preservatives, there's two ways. Um, one is pasteurizing, and you use a retort acid. There are things that are low acidic. If there's like a full scientific way to do it, but it's low acid and then the retort method. They won't do that with a batch of drawers, 100,000 units at a time. And the smaller co-packers can do hot filling. And so with hot filling, you can actually shelf stabilize the product without using pasteurizers. Um, but the problem with those food packages is that they're not going to be able to saute and roast and bake the food the way that we do it, right? They're processing in these giant industrial um, pureeing containers, and they're actually processing purees already and not using things that we already do. So the other question is, you know, you, you were talking about the growth of the organic market in particular. And maybe I didn't see it, but I didn't notice that your product is organic. Yeah, so we only use organic uh, products or products that are grown sustainably, um, which is why so, uh, we're pursuing non-GMO certification. We're not pursuing organic certification because there are practices out there that are a lot better than organic, and people just don't know about it. And we want to work with those farmers because those farmers are contributing to a better earth, but some of them can't afford to certify themselves, and some of them um, you know, just for whatever reason can't or don't. Um, and we want to help them, and we want to work with them because it's still a good product and it's grown sustainably. I, I think one of the challenges that you're going to face is that um, I, I can't remember where I read the study, but basically parents of, of infants and young children buy organic for their kids and buy other stuff for themselves. But they will look for an organic label for their kids. Yeah. And the question is, are you really going to be able to re-educate the market? But the ingredient label says organic. So if we use organic, it'll say organic carrots, organic. So if you look at the back of all the jars, it will say organic or sustainably grown. Or most of the stuff we use is organic, um, but it, but we also use. Yeah. Yeah. I, mean, I think that will be a big challenge for you, mm -hmm. where people just look at the label and don't see organic yeah. on it. They will just go on yeah. to the next one. Sure, yeah, sure. Well, not just uh, shoppers, but also in the grocery stores. If they can't carry an organic brand, you know, certification, you may not get attracted. So the the retail stores. Have it. They're, they're actually a lot of retail stores are moving towards this local. You know, there's a huge movement towards local where people are um, compromising organic for local. Um, so, so retail stores have not given us that much initiative. I think the education with the consumer is really important, and that's why you know we're at farmers markets. So, getting that face time allows us to tell that story, and people really believe in it, and so then they support us. The grocery store is a little bit different because we're not there. So yeah, that'll be a hurdle. Uh, I can I can kind of fill uh, the pain. In this about how to find a product when it's not traditionally classified. Um, so our product should be in uh, the prepared or like quick to eat salad, but because it's living, then they put in more by floral. Um, and so like that is a huge challenge to educate retailers about how where your product is and um, how to direct people to your product. Um, what type of research have you done into that about like really convincing the retailers into you know? That is how we do it. Like how, how have you found that? You know, the retail retailers that we're in now has been us really I mean, pushing the door down because as you probably know, a lot of these retailers won't work with with you directly. They want to work with a broker, they want to work with a distributor if you're not that big. Um, so once we're in it, they listen to the story and they and they once they taste the product, it sells itself. It's just so different than anything else that's out there. We already have our following from the farmers market because that's where we started. So we're really connected to the community. Um, and then you know we promise all these demos and we have to be in the stores and we have to be educating people and telling them where to find us. And, um, so it's a lot of work and a lot of education. But once people get there, it's, they become really customers. Indeed. So a couple quick points. Um, what's your price? Four dollars. Four dollars for how much? Per jar. Per jar. Four ounces. And one one of those feeds like it's one meal. It depends. A uh, baby that's just starting to eat, so a six month old baby, two meals. Okay. If it's an older baby, nine months, one. All right. Cool. Um, and then a couple quick comments. On, I know we don't have much time, but on your pitch deck, um, you had several like a way to shorten it. Um, you had several great pictures that were really cute, but I think you need to kind of pull those together and really kind of get quickly like through through the problem to this is the solution. Um, I think that'll help you speed it up a little bit. Um, and you know. I didn't necessarily see in there if babies liked it, um, and I thought that that might be a really cute picture to show like the baby like liking it after you had already saw them like being picky. Um, so I think that you can do something really fun with that, um, you know, baby with a smear face, all that good stuff. But good job.
Which one am I pressing? I'm like acknowledging it's not my thing. This one? Okay. Okay, perfect. Well, thank you for giving the opportunity to uh, present to you Scrumptious Pantry, where we craft truly flavorful packaged food products around heirloom fruits and vegetables. You can all agree that the consumer perception of big agriculture and fruit production is changing, right? So they're looking at the tomatoes in the supermarket and they're like, where did the flavor go? They look at the guys in the hazmat suits in the field and they're like, is that safe to eat, right? So consumers are going towards um, reconnecting with the values and the flavors of the conscious agriculture of the past, right? So what we believe is that heirlooms are the answer because heirlooms are true ambassadors to those values, right? Heirlooms stand for rich flavors. They stand for non-GMO. Uh, heirloom fruits and vegetables stand for transparency and for biodiversity. So we're translating those values into packaged food products, and we're creating the leading brand of packaged food products around heirloom flavors. Um, currently, we're mainly doing enhancers and... Um, condiments and preserves, but we're not limiting ourselves by that, so we're kind of thinking Stonewall Kitchen of Ale right in the future. It's all about food the way nature intended food to taste. That is not the presentation that I, the last presentation I sent. I'm so sorry. Okay, we're just going to ball, like, you just don't, disregard the slide, right? I'm going to talk more to um, so basically what um, we're looking at is we're really delivering on three different aspects um, that the consumer trends see right now, right? One is natural and uh, clean and non-GMO. First of all, by using real heirloom ingredients and high-quality ingredients, raw materials, we don't need to add all the BS because the flavor is in the raw material. Secondly, heirlooms are naturally non-GMO. Uh, the second big trend that we're delivering on is taking back the kitchen. We saw that earlier with uh, Maison Plus. People are wanting to cook more. They're wanting to take the kitchen back, but I don't know how. So we're delivering products that are flavor forward and empower people, even if they're just assemblers, to do a little something and create in the kitchen. But our products are nuanced enough that those consumers that really want to go and create and create recipes and you know, be sort of inspired our products deliver on that too. And then the other thing that we do is we develop um, recipes, all the products that we develop are products that are focused on um, simple meal solutions. So we're not going to make like complicated products that you know, end up in four course meals. But last but not least, it's about flavors. It's all about um, really high quality heirloom ingredients, unique flavors, and the flavor experience is a big trend that you're seeing right now as well, right? You see the growth of the ethnic market, you see like matcha and sriracha, like consumers are just fed up of like the same old flavors. So going back to those unique heirloom varieties, and if you come back to the table in the end, we have like a hot sauce using wild forged American persimmon, right? That's a super unusual flavor and that's exciting. So yeah, <laughs> there would be another slide now telling you where we're at right now. Um, we've been around since 2011. Um, we started locally in Chicago, so I'm actually visiting from the Great Midwest. Um, 2015, 2013, we started collaborating with Whole Foods. They approached us because they really loved this whole idea of heirlooms as the non-GM part of the non-GMO uh, mission. And we have um, since been successful, great um, response from the buyers. We're in about 800 stores nationally uh, with the hot sauces, all the whole foods, lots of like small retailers, natural um, organic food stores. But of course, then we have like we have good margins. Um, we have the heirloom trend that we see is growing. 
but we do have uh, some challenges as every sort of undercapitalized startup has. Um, so we're like right now looking to, you know, A, of course, create, create brand awareness so we can increase velocity. Um, it's about building out food service. It's about building out the e-commerce channel and um, thinking about brand extension. So where are we going from here? And those are actually also the two questions I have for all of you guys. How do we translate heirloom to the masses? Like what is important? Like when you think about heirloom, what's important for you? Is it um, the flavor aspect? Is it the clean label aspect? Or is it something else? And now my second question that I'm asking for input for you, for you is growing the product line. Um, when you're thinking about heirloom flavors, what category and products is that really important to you? Because it might not be important for a mayo, it would be super important for a pasta sauce. I, I guess I start this time. Uh, so I, you know, I tasted the product. I think they're great. Uh, very interesting presentation. Love the idea of, of focusing on heirloom varieties and and, um, and really focusing on flavor. I think that's kind of been a theme uh, this evening. Um, you mentioned um, non-GMO mm -hmm. as sort of one of the sources. I didn't notice, and maybe I missed it on the bottles, that the non-GMO. We're in the certification the process. The, certification process. Um, the ketchup has now been certified, but it took us about. 20 month, and it's not even a there's not a risk ingredient in there. They're just so backlogged. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's like we're all like non-GMO. Like not only are the, the seeds naturally non-GMO, being heirloom varieties, but um, all our ingredients are non-GMO. Because that makes a difference in the totally. foods is, yeah. is pushing towards that. So uh, I think that makes a difference. And obviously, as you think of brand extensions, thinking about getting that mm -hmm. um, that process in place uh, early. Um, and I'll, I'll harp on the organic. I know that's not necessarily the most important, but I assume it's a premium price product. Um, yeah, but we, we're, we're, pro, we're line priced to the premium products that are like the artisanal local sauces. Like if you go to Whole Foods here, we're not the most expensive. There's one that's $7.99. Our hot sauce here would be $6.99. Out in the Midwest is five five sixty nine. dollars um, I feel like shopping the wrong place. <laughs> <laughs> it's not Cholula, but if you're compared to like Dave Gourmet's or you're compared like to sort of the artisanal like AB local here in Brooklyn, it's line price to that. Um, so we're kind of taking that, um, like we have healthy margins nevertheless, but um, yeah, we're compared to the fact that we're non-GMO. None all of our competitors, although they have a more expensive product, are non-GMO, so we pay more for our ingredients. And just a, a, a strange, uh, perhaps strange question: Why, why are you in New York? There's why are you businesses that yes. tend to be New York-based? Yes. Why not? Well, um, we've been, um, as I said, we've been around since like 2011. I moved here from Italy in 2010 with the idea to start this this business, um, a tar, like sort of terroir-driven uh, food company. Um, and you know, we've been in Chicago for five years. I know everyone and everything. I think um, you know in Chicago, and I just felt that you know as a growing business that has a national presence, but as I mentioned, you know, you're always undercapitalized as, as a food startup, as a food brand. Um, I just, you know, think it'd be, like, New York is just a natural market to sort of spend more time in. So I'm here like every couple of, um, every couple of months and I was Googling events and you guys came up. I'm like, that is awesome. <laughs> and I'm a founding, I was at the Albuquerque Slow Money event there, like the founding one. So Slow Money is close to my heart as a mission. Uh, um, so how do you think about takes? Like, like the, when I think about uh, new like condiment brands, I think of Burger King. Mm -hmm. um, how yeah, do I, you, I dream of nine million dollars at night too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, how do you how do you think um, as far as taste? I will, you know, how do you think that you compare? And then I also was looking at the ketchup, and it looks a little. Um, fluid. Mm -hmm. um, do you find that that's what per, uh, consumers are looking for, or do they want kind of the Heinz thicker ketchup? Have you been seeing any questions? Yeah, I mean, um, the ketchup is most probably our most sort of interesting product and most challenging product in that respect because we're so different from what people are used to from Heinz. Um, in the sense that we use crushed tomatoes, we don't use paste, we use fresh onions, so we have texture in our ketchups, right? We do that purposely because we want to make a ketchup that's closer to the traditional sense of ketchup and is pure in its flavor and you can actually taste tomatoes. Um, but yes, not every consumer that wants a ketchup, you know, wants that. Which is why we spell our ketchup with a C and not with a K. 
Um, and I think the big difference, like, huh, like the, the sort of Kensington in its flavor sensation is very close to what a ketchup ketchup is. We are different from what a ketchup ketchup is, but we work as a ketchup. I mean, we have one ketchup has cranberries and chipotle to work with, like, white meat. We have a ketchup with rosemary and juniper berries to work with burgers. So it's more about food pairings and flavor pairings. Is that expressed on your label anyway? Uh, yes. How do I know that? Well, you see, it says ingredients down here, and then it'll, like, in, in the site text. But, yes, labels can always be improved. <laughs> Who's the guy on the? Uh, the farmers. Um, so a couple of things. Like when I think of heirloom, um, you know, as a farmer, I think of like eggplants. Uh, I think of you know tomatoes, obviously, but I think of basil, um, and so basil, pesto, mm -hmm. um, you know, corn. Um, I think I think about those type of things, um, which I notice that most of your stuff is tomato based. Uh, is are you looking at other vegetables for new skews, or are they all going to be both? Well, it's really just the ketchups that are tomato based, and they're not yet 100% tomato heirloom tomatoes because there's like always like an up and down in, in availability. Um, we actually have a pickled peppers, pickled cucumbers. Our hot sauce is one hot sauce. There are two hot sauces with um, peppers, heirloom peppers. One with wild forage persimmon, um, and the relishes. One is green tomato. One is beet and apple. So yes, like like I'm actually always being told that I don't have enough tomato products to trigger that automatic oh heirloom sensation because that's a big thing that I'm looking at. Lots of people think that we're a tomato brand because not enough consumers have like really understood that heirloom is more than just. And do you think about different um, products that would match well with different heirloom varieties? Because to me, uh, we grow in our backyard, so I'm familiar with the idea that like this eggplant is good for this and that eggplant is good for something else. It's not really that like replacing a generic tomato with an heirloom tomato is the same thing. It seems to me that you want to diversify the products you're in those vegetable categories. Um, yeah, that's something. I mean, for example, if you look at our hot sauces, we use different heirloom peppers because they have different flavors. So yes, yeah, so on the first it's about showcasing the varieties and their purity. All right, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. All right, next up we have Princess from Divya's Kitchen. And your timer will be here. And there's no amplification. No, no amplification. If you just stand right there, people will see you on, on their couches at home. And then this is the? This is these arrows. Yep. And it'll be up. There you go. <laughs> All right. Oh. There you go. That's my lovely wife, Divya. She's the heart of Divya's Kitchen tonight, and I'm the mouth. Uh, so, yeah, I'm the co founder, uh, along with my wife, Divya's Kitchen, uh, CEO, and our purpose is to expand Ayurvedic food into the mainstream. How many people have heard of Ayurveda? Oh, great. Well, you could think of it as uh, the yoga diet, um, and uh, it's 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 a sister or tradition to the yoga tradition from ancient India, about 5,000 years old, and it deals with uh, health through um, through diet, and it deals with the whole experience of food. Um, so the dining, the cooking, the combination of flavors, the menu planning, um, each is an integral part of using food for health. Uh, so we provide, whoa, trigger happy. <laughs> we provide uh, this kind of food through a subscription meal delivery service, uh, which offers um, customized deliveries to support individual needs, uh, business, business catering, and we're planning to launch a cafe. Uh, we've actually been running the catering service and meal delivery service uh, for about five years. The nonprofit we founded in 2005. Um, called Bhagavad Life. And Bhagavad Life, uh, my wife and I actually were monks for about 10, 15 years. And Bhagavad Life, as a nonprofit, we used. Um, boy. Bhagavad Life, as a nonprofit, uh, we, we used Ayurvedic food as an integral part of a meditation retreat that we're doing throughout the country. And we use this food and the dining experience as a way to support people going into uh, 
like an intensive meditation practice. So we came here into uh, the East Village um, in 2009, and suddenly our food service, um, well, specifically our, our, our food in, in the form of cooking classes, um, <laughs> sorry, um, uh, became prominent. And before we knew it, we had 8,000 people signing up for cooking classes. Um, we have the first, the nation's first Ayurvedic chefs training, professional to Ayurvedic chefs training. And kind of in a response to this, people started to ask us to cook for them. <laughs> a lot of people started asking. And uh, as a result, we, um, I don't know why it's doing this. Okay. Well. <laughs> Um, anyway, so we um, we have a diverse client base. Uh, we have a lot of corporate clients with our catering, um, top wellness and yoga brands, uh, conscious capital type organizations. Um, we also have our largest catering client right now is a giant private equity firm, and we currently have, as a nonprofit, about 20, uh, 25 to 12,000 per month in revenue, about a quarter of a million annuals. And so what we're doing with Divis Kitchen is reporting over these services into a for-profit business. Um, so the idea is to take the food uh, service that's on the ground right now, the meal subscription and catering, and to inject, we've actually done all this without any marketing and sales. Um, it, we just happen to have a good location. We're on the fifth floor. But uh, we're just kind of spread and it took off. So what we're doing with this new business is we're pouring the food services into a for-profit model, equipping them with marketing, sales resources, and uh, actually our kitchen is too small to expand, so uh, we're pretty much larger kitchen, and then gradually developing a cafe. Um, and with the common base of operation uh, and and a semi-fixed cost base between the three uh, businesses, there is uh, this quite a, a room for profit growth. And <laughs> we have our lovely team, who we've been working with for several years. I'll get you there. Sorry. Maybe it's the files. I, can I think yeah, it's the files. We have this beautiful team. Um, we've been working with them for several years. This is just a few of them. We have a staff of two people, and. Um, yeah, our capital raise is relatively low. It's about six hundred thousand for, for a restaurant. Um, and a lot of that's because we have, you know, we have a quarter of a million in food service revenue already on the ground, um, and we're going to, you know, have this initial version in a uh, space that's already built out to reduce costs. Um, anyways, we plan on launching this in a couple months, and we hope to serve the world. Uh, I think, um, you know, I know you. Uh, we all, we, we share out the space that I think I know. Um, so I'm very familiar with the food. Um, I eat it uh, every other week. What do you think? Uh, it's good. Um, I, was, I, I grew up vegetarian, though. Um, so I'm, I'm very accustomed to it. Yeah. Um, uh, why brick and mortar and not partner with a company like Means on Plus or um, Laboring to develop a specific menu that you guys are projecting, almost like a licensing. Menu. Well, we have clients that stay with us for two, three, four years. We know them. We go to the department. So our like we deliver the food. They get those keys to their their kids in apartments, so places to themselves. Um, so uh, the, the food service is kind of electric. Um, in terms of the meal subscription. Uh, brick and mortar, uh, we want it to be accessible. I mean, we have uh, 2,000 people taking cooking classes here. So for them to have a place to go to get heat, get ingredients, to experience the food, bring people there. Uh, it's, a, it's a quick point of access. We can sell catering to work from. Um, how well is that concept kind of permeated in? Yeah, is it? Ayurveda? Yeah. Well, Ayurveda, it, it really is the diet of yoga. So right. yoga is popular. Ayurveda is kind of on that crust. It's not as popular as yoga, but you know, 
be positive for us as a community. I guess my question is really about the competition. Who, who, if you're entering brick and mortar, oh, sure. you're entering a different world. There's only so one competition. There's so. only uh, two real brick and mortar. One are getting cafe. Sorry, very ethnic, very like traditional Indian. Um, we have an advantage. We have a very innovative teacher who uh, is from an ancient lineage and um, is also innovative. So you can apply the principles to different geographical settings, different culinary styles. So our food is not, it's, it's diverse and creative. Um, so it goes beyond the Indian style. And uh, the price point's similar. Um, and it's not as spicy. You know, it's, it uh, works well for this. And so you were talking about doing, I guess there's sort of three different models built yeah, into yeah. this, which is very difficult <coughs> to, uh, to do at a, at a growth stage, to try to focus on more than one thing at a time. Um, but it seems like you're focusing on, I, I, I couldn't tell if you're focusing on the meal delivery service or the cafe as really where you want to go Yeah, so we're, we're first. Right, right. The idea is to take the food services we're running right now as meal delivery and catering and we equipped it within a for profit. So we can actually put marketing and sales resources to ramp it up. And and then use that base of operation to, to prototype a scalable cafe. Uh, so we're not pressured by having doors open all the time. Take our time launching it. And and prove a model that can in fact be scalable as a as a almost like a well, fast, slow food uh, right there. How, how many meals are you delivering weekly now or daily? Now? It's fixed. It's Monday, Wednesday, Friday during lunch. Each delivery has three meals, and we have 15, you know, active clients, a pool of 30 or 40 clients, so kind of popping it out. So, so each, so each delivery of the 40 ish is three meals, so it's 100 and some odd meals a week. Yeah, yeah. No, they get each delivery is three meals. They get uh, 12 meals over the course of 12 deliveries. So it's like 15 a month. So I think the scaling of that kind of delivery is going to be very, very difficult. Yeah, it's not going to be so scalable at some point. We don't want to have 500 times. We want to keep the somewhere between 50. I mean, it's $1,000 a month. So it's really not that. I'm sorry, your food service, you want to keep that to about $1,000 operating outside the cafe? Like from the cafe, like you're only doing $1,000? No, no, it's a, per client, $1,000. Oh. Um, so it's, it's like a luxury service. And uh, it's just it's a revenue base, and it provides a base of food operation from which we can have uh, catering and, uh, and cafe pop up and how much catering is there? I know you, I know some of the yeah, that's people, you, uh, some of the companies that you mentioned. So. It's a little nascent. I mean, it's we've been doing that for about eighteen months. We have uh, thirty people. So what I'm understanding is your kitchen currently is too small. You want to yeah. move to a bigger kitchen. You've got three different possible revenue streams. The most established of which is the meal service and the catering. And then the catering is coming up. Strong. And right. the third possibility on the horizon is cafe. Yeah, that's really but where we see the opportunity launch term, is yeah. having several branches that, that, that ride up a common kind of commissary operation. So the idea is to look, let's put like that now. Let's have it be in maybe an out time location, prove it, and then we can, we can spend it. Okay, so that's where I was going with my question. Because if you're looking for a new kitchen space and you were envisioning it as a commissary kitchen, you might come up with a different rental cost than if you were. Establishing a cafe. Yeah, we're going more towards like a commissary, commissary. like maybe I'll paint the path a little bit, have to be a destination point. I think that point has to be more clear if you're going to be. Well, it is, it is. I mean, yeah. we, this isn't our normal deck. Okay. Yeah, we're pretty clear about it. Yeah. Okay. Our business is 80% meals and, and catering in the first five days. How big do you see yourself in five years? In five years, we could be rocking, rocking that out. <laughs> How, How does that mean to you? Uh, I would say we're at a point where we're, you know, two or three cafes and the catering and then those are six. We're, you know, we're at two or three million. Uh, All right. Thank you so much. Thank you.
sorry, listen. If you dance or sing, you can do that. I can start. Hi guys, um, so um, my name is Nick, I'm the CEO and founder of Wisp.com. Um, we're a tech startup from the UK. I'm a bit jet lagged, but delighted to be here. Um, thanks very much for um, allowing me to come in and introduce to, um, Wisk. We're going to be launching in the US in the next three to six months, um, so we're a UK tech startup at the moment. Um, so our mission is to empower people um, to live happier lives through food. Hopefully I'll be able to describe how we're going to be doing that. So essentially we're a smarter shopping list and personal cookbook and people can add their own recipes into our platform, they can bookmark recipes that they find elsewhere on our platform, um, they can then create shopping lists from those recipes, and once they, the way that we get most users onto our platform is we integrate with recipe sites. So recipe sites like All Recipes, Food Network, a bunch of other sites in the UK, run about 300,000 recipes, uh, where we, on, in the ingredients, people see our buttons, they click it, and they add things to the shopping list. Um, we integrate with big e-commerce stores, so e-commerce, all the four biggest um, UK e-commerce stores, when you have a shopping list, you can click transfer and it sends all the items across into your e-commerce store for people to buy. Um, where we see adding the most value to people is through intelligent recommendations based on what you have in your cookbook and based on what you have in your shopping list. I hope you'll be able to explain a little bit more about that to you as well. This is a demo of what it looks like on all recipes. You see our button, which is the orange thing here. You click it, it adds all the ingredients to the shopping list. Um, I can now, this is the that you pick with the shopping list. So, Every, anything I add from anywhere on any site goes into one list. We can buy the ingredients. Um, I can add things, delete things. I can organize it by aisle, make it simple to tick off when I'm in store. Um, I can take it offline into store by emailing it, syncing it to our apps. Um, I can print it. Um, if I print it, again, I've got a tick off checklist. I can walk around store. That's how most people use our list, offline, in store. Um, or if I want to buy at an online store, I choose which store that is in the drop down menu and we geo-target that, and we'll soon have some US stores on that. Um, you click next, and it turns on the list into a list of store items, accurately matched, I can swap those, it personalizes which items it chooses for me at store and learns, um, and then I send it across into the store. We make money from retailers paying us commissions and through ads. So we allow ads like this, which are basically native in-content, in-feed ads in the ingredients, based on what we call purchase intent. But someone intends to purchase, in this example, butter, we'll put an ad and a tip around why you should buy a certain type of butter or a certain type of brand. Um, so essentially what we're doing is we're connecting inspiration from existing publishers to places where you can go and buy it from existing retailers. We allow brands to advertise in the middle of that. Um, so it's a free service for any publisher to use, and we share revenue back with publishers who um, have our system installed. Um, I mentioned earlier on where we see adding real value is in the, kind of the intelligent recommendations. So what we do is we link all content onto a concept we call the food genome, which essentially is a massive graph of all the different content that exists in the world of food. And we know information about like each item, nutrition, flavor, perishability, price. So based on someone's cookbook or based on their shopping list, we can give people recommendations on four pillars, looking at what waste ingredients will you have by cooking this recipe and buying these items, and what can you do with that waste ingredient? Uh, what's the perfectly paired uh, starter for the main course, or wine goes with the uh, meal? We've done this with some of the biggest brands in the UK um, already. Um, looking at nutrition, how you can optimize your shopping list or your cookbook, and looking at price and coupons, obviously. Um, so we, uh, we work with some of the biggest publishers in the UK. Uh, we've launched with About.com uh, here in the, the US. Hoping to launch with a bunch of other publishers soon. And we work with some of the biggest brands, we work with some of the biggest retailers, and we have agreements with some new, new US retailers soon. And we'll be opening up a US office um, in the next three to six months. We have a team of, a of, we have a team of uh, 20 people uh, based out of Birmingham, which is about an hour north of London. Uh, we've had a bunch of different press, um, uh, and we've won some different awards for what we do. Um, we launched two and a half years ago. Um, I pitched it to Lord Sugar, um, the Donald Trump of the UK, um, I know, terrible, um, in the final of the BBC Apprentice. In, in the UK, it's not a show where you go for a job, you go for a festival, and it's not like Donald Trump. Um, and that's how we launched two and a half years ago in the UK. Uh, we're now on uh, 30 million monthly impressions, 200,000 uh, months, and we'll be in the US very soon. We'll love it if you try us. Um, we're in 11 uh, language, uh, countries and six languages. Thanks. Uh, yeah, first, uh, great presentation. Um, so we've actually done this once in a while. You know, when I when I saw when I see the interact uh, the interactive nature of your of the 
uh, shopping list, I think about um, companies that I started to get, I'm starting to use now, like Amazon now, um, and things where I'm on a retailer's site and um, I can, you know, not necessarily put in all the recipes, but I can just go ahead and click over exactly what I need. Um, you know, do you feel like people are going, like, which do you see is the biggest growth, the offline shopping list or the online clickability, just, you know, kind of, I want this recipe to buy now, that sort of thing. Um, so the online piece is of high strategic importance to CPG brands, retailers, um, and also there is a loyal base of people who use them. But the offline piece, dwarfs anything that is currently happening online um, and will happen in the next five years. Mm -hmm. And that, so in the UK, 20% of people do online grocery shopping because we're the highest per capita country uh, place in the world. And um, so they spend 25% of their money online, which means that 5 to 6% of grocery spend happens online. It basically means that 95% happens offline. And even with the people who do use online grocery shopping, they have an omni-channel experience. So they spend some of they do the online shop and they'll do some offline. So actually having uh, an intermediary who helps you do both those shops and gives you recommendations for both of those um, is the best, we think is the best user experience. Um, so we think that's stuff that will work. But it's definitely people that are not our target market who do just who will just shop in Amazon now. And we will that, that that's not not what people are trying to target. Indeed. So the food genome, if I, let's say if I order a recipe with you guys and if there's like this overlap of you know this one obscure ingredient that I use. Yeah. Does this actually suggest another recipe that would pair well with that? You know, so, so that this, I there's different types of consumers who care about different things. Some people care about weight, some people care about, most people care about time, uh, nutrition, uh, money. Um, so we kind of have different types of recommendations, and it's very, very personalized to, to, to the individual. So um, there's different types of recommendations. Uh, a leftover recommendation would be you've got these items in your shopping list, you're likely to have them left over because they're perishable, high value, you care about eating it up, and your store item looks like it's more than what you need for the recipe or for the portions you're going to cook, and therefore we give you recommendations for those ingredients. But then on another recipe, it might be nutritional things that is recommended to you or flavor things. Um, ideally, we start to combine all those different items, but we have, we have to, we're getting more and more intelligent in how we do it. Um, so it would be, here's what you can do with your waste, based on things that you would enjoy and are flavorful, and based on things that are nutritious, and based on what's a weekly deal, a weekly, weekly circular in your zip code, wherever you are in the US. So that's exactly. where we're going. So is that what is dependable about your website? Yeah, I mean, there's a bunch of people who are doing shopping lists and who are doing e-commerce integrations. There's a bunch of people who um, are doing scrapbooking and stuff. And um, what we're doing is focusing on the food piece, which is what, which is why we can uh, build really intelligent recommendations that know a lot about the content you're adding in, which is basically all most of that technology in natural language processing, which we have been doing for like three years now. Um, so yeah, the, intelli the intelligence, the recommendations, is where we are real value beyond what you'll find somewhere else, beyond the more general tool. Um, and then there is some uh, benefit of being handled the integration with all the different publishers and all the different uh, retailers. So I guess my question is, so what's drive, What's going to drive adoption of uh, your particular app versus the other? Uh, uh, I have a couple of them sitting in my pocket right now yep. that I don't use as often as I want to. Um, but what's going to drive, how are you going to distinguish yourself in terms of driving um, adoption of, of something that's obviously more integrated, but I, I can't remember, I'm pretty sure I've seen others that already integrate with some of the publishers. Yeah, so, um, I mean there's, there's Chicory, there's Popcar, there's Consul Commerce, there's a bunch of different guys. And so the, the few, two, there's two kind of pillars outside of functionality, which is kind of uh, everyone's all have roughly the same kind of stuff more or less. Um, one is integrations, so with publishers, so you have much more visibility to people. Uh, people that's, we, we get, I uh, mentioned, 200,000 people, about 150,000 of those find us on recipes. And we, then the retail integrations are good for people who really, really care about that piece, and they're good for pulling uh, price information into recommendation, uh, into recommendations. Um, but the bit that really differentiates us, and we hope to differentiate us in the future, is um, all around uh, recommendations, so intelligence and the Fuji. That's kind of how you know you would use us rather than Pocket or Evernote to create your cookbook, and you use and, and for for our shopping list, you use us instead of Chicory or Popcar because we do the omni-channel piece and the integration. Any other comments from the panel? I'm wondering if you're going to be what success looks like in two years, five years. Um, I think the, it goes back to our mission, which is like. 
if we can make people ha happier, um, with, like if we can add value to people with our application, that's really what we're trying to do. And um, hope what we hope to be is on the majority of recipe sites. We hope that the majority of people will have cookbooks with us. And um, yeah, um, and, and this we have some kind of social drivers as well. Um, like waste food is, is a huge issue um, around the world. In the UK, families throw masses of food out. Uh, people who eat nutrition eat healthily enough. Uh, there's a whole different like and we think we can help people by being intelligent, by being like, connecting inspiration to purchase. So I guess the ultimate thing for us is if we can add value to people and, and, and a lot of people that does it feel. Um, in my 47 seconds. That is the last presentation for today. Just let's just give everybody who presented a big round of applause. Thank you a lot. Um, there's a bunch of people that I need to thank because we did not put this on alone. First, just a big round of applause for our panel of experts. To our co-hosts for the event, Slow Money NYC. If you guys have any questions about Slow Money and the investments that they make and the work that they do, talk to any of these three folks. Um, to the food stand team that's been out here helping, to our lovely bartender. Everybody say hello to the bartender. <laughs> and then this is the first time we've had a host. That's my timer. I should shut up now. Um, uh, we had we've we've expanded the host committee to five really incredible organizations that have helped to put this on. So the Alley NYC, which is an incredible co-working space, the folks at Reserve, uh, who have an awesome restaurant booking app. Uh, if you guys did not get your twenty-five dollar credit, please get it in the front. You get twenty-five dollars in free dining around New York. The folks at Food Tech Connect, which are basically the hub of all good food tech news and information. Um, the folks that consider Bardwell for the cheese, Brooklyn Brewery, please take a photo of yourself holding this delicious, delicious beer because they've been gracious enough to give it to us and you can take a picture with Dana. Um, and I'm totally blanking on the last one and I'm going to take my paper so I don't forget National Gourmet Institute. There are also discount codes coming your way for classes as well as flyers up in the front. And Brooklyn Food Works, which is um, opening up in November or December, which is going to be a new kitchen incubator uh, out in Brooklyn in the Pfizer building. If you guys have food startups and you're looking for space, check them out. Um, so I think that's everybody and everything. Um, and thank you most importantly for all of you for coming out tonight. I think this is a testament to the community that we're building in the city, and it, and it only works if you guys continue to show up. So look out for the invite for the next one. October 26th is our next spotlight. Applications are open, and we'll see you next month. Beer is left over, so please drink it. There's a little bit. Yeah. Yeah.